Hello and welcome to the Pembrokeshire Bird Diary for June 2020. I'm Annie Haycock from the Pembrokeshire Bird Group and this month we have contributions from several observers around the county. We'll start with Richard and Giselle on Scocom. Following a pectoral sandpiper on North Pond on the 31st of May, which we forgot to mention last month, June started well, with the third hobby of the year and the only spring record of pied flycatcher on the 1st. Whilst June on Skokum can produce mega rarities such as the 2017 Myrtle Warbler and the 2015 Swainson's Thrush, this is also our busiest time of year for seabird monitoring. Much of our time is spent counting seabirds and following their breeding attempts. Whole Island counts of 5,101 guillemot and 3,517 razorbill were both new Skokum records. The North Pond Oyster Catch and Roost attracted a passing knot on the 7th. It's just the second June record of this species, and the first juvenile stone chat arrived from the mainland on the 9th. By the 11th, all but two pairs of razor bills at the next study plot had relayed after losing their eggs in last month's storms. The first chuff fledglings of the year were on the plateau above Steep Bay on the 16th. The 21st saw a stunning female rose-coloured starling arrive to Wheatier Rock. She was being constantly bombarded by angry meadow pipits and quickly relocated to the Bluffs Puffing Colony. Uh, luckily the peregrines had moved their nest site to Far Bay, leaving her to feed in peace. This was just the fifth Skokum record and the third sighting of an adult. A greenish warbler was feeding in the courtyard on the afternoon of the 23rd. A little egret on the 24th was the first since 2018 and the first Mediterranean gull and sandwich terns of the year were logged the following day. By the 27th, nearly half of the guillemot and razorbill jumplings had leapt into the choppy sea, where blustery conditions resulted in five-figure counts of Manx shearwaters from the lighthouse. Two summer-plumaged Icelandica black-tailed godwit on the 28th rounded off a pleasant month. While people weren't supposed to be travelling far, gulls had no such restrictions. Derek Grimwood throws food out for the birds in his garden and herring gulls have discovered the bounty. He noted that one was ringed, W969. It was easily traced back to Skokom, where it had been seen at a nest with three small chicks a fortnight before. Richard and Giselle had another look for it, and yes, it was still there, now feeding two larger chicks. The girl was doing a twice daily commute for an easy takeaway. Up in the north of the county, Wendy was happy to be able to get out bird watching on the Tithe estuary again. With the easing of lockdown restrictions, the beginning of June saw a very welcome return to recording birds around the Tyvee. On the first few visits down to the estuary, it was apparent that migration north wasn't over. On Poppet, there were ten sandling, along with seven ring plovers and seven dunlin. Around a hundred barnacle geese were around the estuary every day at the start of the month. These are the flock that breed on nearby Cardigan Island, where there were 40 nests on the count last year. A single drake gadwall, molting into his eclipse plumage, was unusual for the tyvee, and a tufted duck was also seen. There were around 45 black-headed gulls around the estuary, and another for 35 feeding on the reserve in front of curlew hide. Most of these black-headed gulls were second-year birds, and this number is unusual for us in early June. On the 11th, there were two avocets feeding in the channels for a few hours. A handful of locals that managed to see them were grateful to Howard and Sue and Thomas for the news after they spotted them from their house. These are thought to be the first record of avocets for the Tyvee. A change in the weather and the rain dropped some birds in on the falling tide on the 18th. Eleven adult sandwich terns were nice to see, along with two adult Mediterranean gulls and seven redshank. On the 25th of June, a rose-coloured starling was just across the estuary at Goobert. The highlight of the month, though, was a Bonaparte's gull. It was found by Richard Dobbins on the 23rd by the Webley Hotel. As well as good views on the ground, we were treated to a fly round of this smart adult, calling distinctively as it chased mostly dull, non-adult, malting, black-headed gulls. For those who don't know the Tyvee, this location of salt marsh and sandbanks by the Webley, now updated and renamed the Tyvee Waterside, is excellent for watching gulls, terns and waders, 
particularly as the tide drops. Towards the end of the month, gull numbers there were increasing, with the start of what was to be an unprecedented number of Mediterranean gulls and an exciting early July to look forward to. On the estuary around land shipping, Bob and I spent time watching the new shell duck broods dipping their toes into the water for the first time. Some territories failed to produce any young, despite the male keeping close guard over his mate and nest. Others produced large broods, though most of the shell ducklings seemed to disappear over the next week or so. We don't often see Mediterranean gulls this far up the estuary, so it was quite a surprise to find at least 19 of them roosting together with a few black-headed gulls. Perhaps the blustery weather had driven them to seek shelter here. Having spent time every spring for the past three decades or so checking on chuff and peregrine nest sites on the coast, it had been a little frustrating to be missing out this year. However, when we did get out, it was clear the birds had been able to breed quite happily without us keeping tabs on them, and most were now getting on with showing their families how to survive in the great wide world. Richard Ellis, down in the south, was lucky enough to be within reach of a peregrine nest that he could keep an eye on, from a suitable long distance, of course. He has been monitoring this nest for the last three years, and so has got to know the pair well. For each of the last two years, they've successfully raised three chicks. This year, incubation began around 9th of April. Hatching was between the 14th and 16th of May, and he had his first glimpse of the chicks about a week later. By the 8th of June, it was possible to tell there were two female and one smaller male chick. For the last two years, it's been the other way round. By the second week in June, the female was starting to spend time away from the nest, resting or hunting. And on the 14th of June, he saw both parents enjoying a takeaway on the nearby ledge. By the 22nd of June, the young had lost all their down and were flapping around the nest area. The first chick, one of the females, fledged on the 24th of June, but promptly disappeared, never to be seen again. The remaining two stuck very closely together after that. Finally, on the 27th of June, these two made their first proper flights, and Richard continued to watch them intermittently for the next few weeks. And now we're finished with Lisa down on the GAN. And the GAN... It was quite quiet in June. We saw a, a sort of regular turnover of waders at the start of the month. There were 21 sandling on the 4th on the beach. Dunlin and Ringplover joined in them, 30 of each. A handful of bar and black quits uh, through the month. And the curlew numbers just starting to build into double figures by mid-month. I think the really notable thing about the GAN this year has been the lack of disturbance. Um, very few walkers, very few dog walkers and no overnight camping just allowed everything to have a bit of a breathing space. And that was really noticeable with the shell duck here. We had two to three pairs through the month. And by the 9th of June, we were really pleased to see three shell ducklings on the lagoon near the car park. And although the number of shell ducklings went down to two, uh, a few days later, probably victim to a great black bat gull, by the end of June, we had two really big shell ducklings doing really well, feeding on the lagoon with their parents here. So a real testament to a quieter season perhaps, and perhaps the way we need to start to think about managing the GAN in the future. By the end of the month, uh, little egret numbers were starting to build. We had 11 birds um, coming and going from the GAN and the salt marsh. Just the handful of med and black-headed gulls coming through, and the curlew numbers continued to rise on the salt marsh with numbers up to 60 on some days, including some ringed adults that are part of the ringing scheme here. But for me, June will be remembered as probably the first June in 20 years that I've actually spent on the mainland in Pembrokeshire, having lived for most of my time here on, on various islands. And um, it was the reed warblers that I'll really remember. There were six territories, all active, between the house at Crab Hall and the car park at the GAN at Jubilee. Um, and there were other pairs further up towards Mullock as well. And it was just a real treat for me to lie in bed at night and uh, as it's getting dark, listen to reed warblers singing and a gropper, a grasshopper warbler, reeling in the reed bed right outside the window. What a real treat for me. Well, there were some views of the bird life in Pembrokeshire in June. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for a look at the birds in July. <laughs>